Ah, oh, bad. Jewel of the stir. Manfred murmured, leaning across his knee, red eyes gazing at the approaching docks in barely repressed eagerness. It has been some time since I last tasted its delights, he continued more loudly as he turned. The six newly made vampires hissed and snarled in reply as they clustered about him, feral faces twisted with hunger. Manfred slapped aside the vampires who'd gotten too close and snarled at a thirsty pack, causing all of them to scramble to the opposite side of the deck. He drained them dry over the course of the trip, and then filled them up again with his essence. Their thoughts, full of hunger and frustration, fluttered around the edges of his consciousness like moths around a dark flame. Ruthlessly, he spread the tendrils of his mind and gathered their thoughts before crushing them, causing the vampires to twitch and moan. Satisfied that now they would cause no trouble, he grunted and turned away to watch the zombie crew move mechanically about their duties. In truth, he would have preferred to avoid the entire mess of creating more of his kind. Weak-minded as they were at the moment, they were more of a threat to each other than to him. But as his experiences with Brother Conrad had shown, vampires were not pack animals, despite being able to assume the form of wolves. Unfortunately, he needed servants of a more durable nature than Andre and his fellows. Armies had to start somewhere. He extended his tongue, tasting the air. It was foul, this close to the city smelling as it did of industry and strange spices. But below that, he could send the far sweeter smell of death and necromancy. It was a familiar scent, and not in the general fashion that all things derived from necromancy were familiar. It was frustrating, this familiarity. Magic, when wielded by a particular hand, had a particular odor. It was a tang that prodded at the heightened senses of sorcerous beings like Manfred. He could follow that tang across any ground, as his every instinct now urged him to do. To hunt was his nature, and it had been too long. He signaled the zombie to drop anchor in a bend in the river. The boat would be safe enough there, on the outskirts of Wurtbad's docklands. Abandoned jetties and outbuildings lined the shore, used only by smugglers and other rabble engaged in illicit activities. Other than a few members of the River Watch, who were in the pay of those aforementioned individuals, no one would notice. Not until morning at any rate, and he intended to be somewhere else by then. Wurtbad played host to a number of secret places and layers for one of his kind. He had set up most of them himself, in fact, during his last visit. Planning and preparation had ever been his way. The cautious spider, rather than the rabid wolf, as Conrad had been. He had been even more cautious than Vlad in the end. Suddenly, he looked up, eyes widening slightly, and grunted. No, it couldn't be, he muttered, pulling the scrap of Stillman's flesh out of his belt. But if it is... He traced a brand with the tip of a claw. It had been the thought of Vlad that had done it. That was where he had seen the brand before. And a very particular brand it was. Would they dare? Manfred said, looking at his vampires as if expecting a reply. But none was forthcoming, of course. Their will was his will. They could have no other. There was a scrape of wood on wood as the crew brought them close to the jetty and he turned, stuffing the scrap back into his belt. He glanced at the vampires and pointed at them. Stay until I call for you, and then come in all haste he said. Without waiting for a reply, he leapt from the prow to the jetty, shape blurring as he fell. Bones cracked and twisted, and stiff hairs pierced his flesh like a thousand spear points, causing him to be surrounded in a bloody mist as he dropped downwards. Changing shape was a pleasurable kind of pain for Manfred. The bodies of his kind were dead, and thus ultimately malleable. The more power they had, the more shapes were theirs to assume. Weak, as he still was, there was only one shape that met his current need. Four feet landed on the jetty, causing the wood to bow slightly, and the great black wolf bounded into the fog. Manfred ran faster than any wolf, however, and the claws struck gouges in the wood of the jetty. 
Muscles pumping with stolen blood, he sprang from the jetty to the roof of an outbuilding and then ran towards the city. He went unnoticed past the trio of watchmen heading to investigate the newly arrived barge, and gave a silent snarling laugh at the thought of what awaited them, should they board the barge. The new followers would satiate their hunger on the unlucky men, and be ready to aid Manfred in whatever endeavor awaited him tonight. The wolf dropped into the crooked alleys of Lowtown, moving with the surety of one whose absence had not resulted in much change in old haunts. The empire did not change, Manfred knew. It simply persisted. It was as much a zombie as Andre, lumbering down through the centuries, its blood growing thinner and thinner with each generation. That was reason enough to put it out of its misery. The wolf that was Manfred growled in satisfaction, thinking of things to come. He would rebuild his forces in secret in the Empire, and when the time was right, when the eyes of the defenders were turned elsewhere, he would strike. The wolf bounded up onto the awning of a vendor's stall and leapt onto a sloping roof, scrambling up across. He ran on the rooftops of Lowtown, following the skies of dark magic he had scented in the harbor. They were permeating the town, tangled up in the damp mist that seeped upwards out of the streets. Manfred skidded to a halt as the stench of rotting meat and spoiled milk caught his attention. He loped to the edge of the roof and gave a bark of surprise when he saw the pale shapes of a dozen or more ghouls creeping towards him from each direction. They swarmed up walls and across the curves of the rooftops of the city, moving like spiders, their pale gangly limbs flashing in the moonlight as they crept closer but not towards him. The ghouls were creeping towards the building he crouched on. Manfred sank down, inhaling, as his shape billowed back out to its human proportion. He smelled a strong wood fire and cooking meat, fermentation and human sweat. It was a tavern. Manfred rose to his feet even as the first ghoul landed with a thump on the roof. It shrilled at him, bearing yellow teeth. Others joined it, swarming up to crouch in a semicircle of simian malevolence around Manfred. There were twenty of them, and he could smell many more coming closer. One snarled and stretched out a hesitant claw. Manfred met its dim gaze and flashed his fangs. It squeaked and shoved away, nearly dislodging several of its fellows from their perches. The brands on their flesh burned like torches to his eyes, and he snarled. It was the same brand marking Stillman's flesh. They had been sent on some errand, but his presence had cowed them for the moment. Deep in their tainted blood, the creatures knew who their real master was, no matter the petty magics leashing them to hidden hands. Their kind had served his kind since the first degenerate antecedent had sworn fealty to the first vampires. Curious, he stepped aside and gestured. Almost gratefully, the goose piled past him, whimpering and growling. They began tearing at the roof. He could hear their fellows doing the same to the closed shutters of the upper story windows. He watched them for a moment longer and then whispered a guttural phrase. The strings of necromantic magic that were hooked into the brands of the ghouls stretched back the way the beasts had come across the rooftops. Manfred gave a short, sharp laugh and set off on the trail of old friends that he had fought long since gone to their well-deserved graves. Even on two legs, his speed was supernatural, carrying him quickly from the roof of the tavern to another overlooking a bone-colored square, which marked the entry point to the local cemetery. He caught sight of the image on the floor of the plaza and hissed, throwing up a hand instinctively. Wincing, he hurled himself the distance from the edge of the roof to the top of the wall surrounding the Garden of Moor. Even Manfred, the most logical of his breed, felt some small disquiet at the thought of willingly entering an abode of the god of death. Everything that Moor was, Manfred and his kind made mockery of. And Moor, like any god, was a jealous entity, and prone to grudges. Crouching on the wall, Manfred sniffed at the air cautiously. The bone garden reeked of dark magic. Like an apple eaten inside out by rot, it was no longer dedicated to the final god, but instead to... To what? It stank of necromancy, and the mist clung fiercely to the headstones and the mausoleums. Manfred dropped down into the cemetery, and the mist coiled up and around him like striking serpents. 
With a gesture, he dispersed it and started towards the chapel. He could feel the tingle of the sacred there, a final holy flame. A bored conspirator, Manfred knew a plot when he stumbled upon one. It would take a sorcerer of his standing years to undermine the innate protections of a garden even as small as this one. And the brand on the ghouls bespoke a familiar band of plotters indeed. Memories came to the fore, bobbing to the surface of his wine-dark thoughts. He smelled the delightful scent of newly spilled blood emanating from the chapel. Licking his lips, he stepped inside. The mist retreated, and Manfred himself felt an invisible pressure radiating from the altar at the other end. A figure knelt there, head bowed in prayer. The syllables struck Manfred like slaps, and he couldn't restrain a snarl. The man sprang to his feet and spun around, eyes widening as he caught sight of Manfred. Who? he began. Manfred did not let him finish. He rushed forwards, cloak flaring out behind him, the curved ridges of his armor swallowing the light. Fangs and claws extended, and he dived onto the warrior. A sword slashed up, nearly bisecting him, and Manfred twisted in midair, avoiding the blow. He landed on the altar and lunged at the swordsman without pausing. Manfred did not know him, but he was familiar nonetheless. He had faced servants of the Death God before, and knew their maggoty stench. The sword burned with letters of cold fire, and Manfred's flesh crawled as he ducked under a precise sweep and dug his claws into his opponent's steel gorget. The blow lifted the warrior off his feet and flung him back to crash into the closest of the benches that lined the chapel. Manfred tossed the bent gorget aside and stalked towards the warrior, who lay in the ruins of the bench, gagging now. Manfred scooped up the fallen weapon, but then tossed it aside with a yelp. His palm had blistered at the touch of the hilt, and he cursed himself for being foolish. He thought of drawing his own blade, but dismissed the thought. Why sully it? The warrior was trying to get to his feet, one hand to his damaged throat. Manfred could almost admire such determination. Almost, but not quite. Manfred sprang forwards and grabbed the pale man by the head. He restrained the impulse to crush the man's skull like an egg, and instead leaned close. There was something going on, and he wanted to know what. Tell me what you know, he hissed, eyes widening and his thoughts driving forwards to pierce the mind of the captive. The Templar jerked and groaned as blood began to run from the corners of his eyes and nostrils. Manfred pulled him closer. Tell me. The mist seemed thicker somehow, and Felix could taste a hint of strange rot in his sinuses. The mist was high enough now that Gotrek's crest cut through it like a fin. Maybe we should rouse the others, he said, as they left the bone garden behind. Gotrek snorted. And what use would that be, Mandling? Quite a bit, in Olaf's case, I think, Felix said bluntly. He threw a hand in the direction of the garden. You saw the look on his face, Gontrek, and you said yourself that there's bound to be a lot of them loose in Lowtown. We need to alert someone, anyone. What, and spook the corpse eaters? Gontrek seemed aghast. Weren't you the one talking about preventing any further death? Felix snapped. He batted in annoyance at the mist as it curled around his hands. It hung off everything like a wet shroud. It made him think of Hellfen, something he really did not want to think about. Because thinking of Hellfen made Felix think about Stillman and what he was planning. He had not voiced his suspicions as to the necromancer's intention, seeing no need. But he wondered if that had been the correct course, considering what now they'd seen in the Bone Garden. Of course, he had no proof as to what Stillman's intentions had been. He had seemingly been the only one to hear Stillman's ranting, and the thought of it was inconceivable. Resurrecting Manfred von Karstein? The idea was laughable. But then again... Felix shook droplets of wet off his sleeve. He looked up and tried to see the stars through the mist, but it was too thick. We need to get help, Godrek, he said. Especially if... He trailed off. If what? Gontrek said impatiently. The slayer stopped so suddenly that Felix almost ran into him. 
What's stuck in your craw, man, Lang? It's von Karstein, Felix burst out. What? Godric said. That's who Stillman was talking about in the swamp, Felix said. What if he succeeded? What if Elsa was only meant as an appetizer for something that was already back and hungry? Godric shook his head. Manling. He turned to continue on, but by the set of his shoulders, Felix could tell that he was still listening. He decided to press his luck. What if that's what Holtz and Russ were after? Felix insisted. What if the reliquary wasn't a reliquary at all, but a body? Godric stopped again. Felix bobbed from one foot to the other nervously. The mist seemed to press against him on all sides, like hands at an Aldorf orgy. Not even the Sigma rites would be that stupid to not destroy the vampire's body if it had been found, Godric said, but he sounded doubtful. Of course they would, Felix said. It's common knowledge that they keep all kinds of monsters in the Great Temple. Common knowledge, eh? Godric said. Well, rumor and innuendo, but every fiction has a bit of truth, Felix said. Godric, we may not be facing just ghouls, but one of the lords of the undead as well. And? Godric demanded. And? Felix said. Godric, we gotta tell someone. If Manfred von Karstein has returned, the whole empire is in danger. All the more reason to chop the snake's head off now, Godric said. Speaking of which... Felix saw the slayer's axe loop out and he threw himself to the ground. There was a scream from behind him and a ghoul crumpled to the cobbles, jerking and dying. Godric ripped the weapon loose and flicked a blob of sticky blood from the blade. Well, looks like we found the ghouls, he said. Felix looked up and saw dozens of red lights shining above him in the mist. He drew his weapon. Godric roared and cut a falling ghoul in half. A shower of gore filled the alleyway, but Godric did not appear to notice. More ghouls dropped from the walls and the rooftop, moving with almost reptilian grace. Several tried to dogpile the slayer, but Godric became a blur of muscle and metal, and body parts rolled into the gutter. Felix, while not as deadly, was also not the target. The ghouls seemed less concerned with him than with bringing Godric down, and he couldn't blame them. Nonetheless, Karagul darted out and the ghoul staggered, clutching its bloody throat. Felix's former nausea was washed away in a rush of hatred. These creatures were monsters, not men. Whether of their own accord, or at the behest of some monstrous master, they had dug their own grave as far as he was concerned. Any pity he might have had was gone. He hacked and slashed at the figures, and the world dimmed to a red tunnel. Only when the sword scraped the brick of a wall did he come out of it, and he heard Godric laughing. Good, manling, good, but they're getting away. Felix turned and saw black shapes scampering away. Godric was already charging after them. Felix hurried. He could hear the sound of an alarm bell ringing and the cry of horses. He couldn't see where the sounds were coming from, but it sounded like all of Wurtbad was in an uproar. The mist was literally crawling up the walls of the buildings around them. He could barely see a thing in front of his face. Indeed, he lost sight of Godric already. Godric, he said. Do you smell that, man Ling? Godric said, from somewhere close to his elbow. Felix jumped, startled. What? Smoke, Godric said, waving his bloody axe in the mist. Felix sniffed and then looked. There was a dim glow in the haze. And where there's smoke, there's fire, he said grimly. Let's go, Manling. That's Hugo's tavern. The slayer took off at a run and Felix followed. He didn't ask how the Slayer knew that it was Hugo's tavern that was on fire. The dwarf's senses were far keener than a human's. Instead, he concentrated on running. Fear for the others, especially Elsa, filled him, lending him extra speed. If the ghouls had attacked them as they had gone after Godric and him... 
The mist seemed to draw back suddenly, like a curtain being twitched aside, and a two-story inferno was revealed. Hugo's tavern was indeed burning. The street in front of it was jam-packed with people, most running in all directions, and not a few ghouls. The latter were tearing into the panicking crowd with berserk abandon. Godric roared and launched himself on the attack. Felix left him and grabbed the running figure. Where's Hugo? he shouted. They are still inside, the soot-stained man said. Let me go, those things are everywhere. The man jerked himself free of Felix's grip as a ghoul bounded at him. With a start, Felix realized that it was blind, eyes boiled in its sockets, char marks and blisters covering its greasy hide. It leapt towards him, and he jerked Karagul up at the last moment, separating grasping hands from wrists. It shrieked and tumbled past him. Felix didn't bother to finish it. Instead, he rushed past it towards the burning tavern. Gatrek! Hugo and the others are still inside, he called out to the slayer, who was busy bashing his skull into that of an unlucky ghoul. Godric looked up, his face a mask of ghoul blood. Then what are we waiting for, manling? Let us go get them, the dwarf said, dropping the dead ghoul and uprooting the axe from the body of another. But even as they headed for the door, a tide of screaming, burning ghouls barreled out of the fiery tavern and ran blindly at them. Godric shoved past Felix, and his axe swung out in a savage arc, spilling frying entrails and bubbling blood across the street. Felix rammed his sword through a howling ghoul, driving it back through the smoldering doorpost. It clawed back at him in agony, and he ripped Karagul free and dived past it into the tavern. There was smoke everywhere, and Felix pulled his cloak, still damp from the mist, up to his face, hoping it would protect him long enough to find the others. The common room was almost entirely aflame, and comets of burning wood dripped off the ceiling. The upper floors were completely consumed, Felix knew, and anything that had been in them. In the center of the common room, within a ring of overturned tables, stood Olaf, arms out thrust, flames cascading around him like an eggshell and his feet set. Blood stained the front of the wizard's robe, pouring down from his white beard, and even at a distance and through the smoke, Felix could tell that he was weakening. Holtz knelt beside him, cradling a limp shape, and Hugo was slumped nearby, flames licking at his boot heels. Ignoring the heat, Felix rushed towards them. Olaf saw him and gave a bloody smile. His legs began to buckle and his long arms stretched out. Felix felt a moment's relief from the heat. Olaf, you... Caught me in the throat. Surprised me. Olaf gurgled, blinking blearily. Let it loose without thinking. Stupid. He bobbed like a drunkard, but shook his head violently as Felix reached out to steady him. Get them out. Get them out, Jaeger! Get them! Felix looked down. Holtz was slumped and his robe was ripped and bloody. Felix's heart jumped to see Elsa in his arms, however. From above, there came a groan and a crashing creak. He looked up. Grab her and let's go, manling! The ceiling is giving way! Godric snarled. Felix looked over and saw the slayer carrying Hugo draped over his shoulders. The slayer jerked his head and made for the door. Felix reached down to take Elsa from Holtz's slack arms. The priest did not resist. Indeed, he toppled over as Elsa's weight was removed. Felix hesitated, wondering if he should try to get the Sigma right out as well, but Olaf shook his head. He is dead, the stupid bastard. All dead. Go, Jaeger. I can't. I can't keep the flames at bay much longer. He coughed and more blood spilled down his chest. The flames pressed closer suddenly, and he could hear Godric roaring his name. Felix held Elsa close, shrouded in his cloak, and made a lurching run towards the door. He felt, more than saw, Olaf topple to the floor behind him, and one of the stout timber beams of the roof gave way, smashing into the floor and hiding the wizard from sight. With the fire clutching greedily at him, Felix hurled himself and Elsa out the doorway and into the street. Noise ripped in the smoke and filled the air. 
More alarm bells were being rung throughout Lowdown, and the sound of weapons rang through the streets. Dropping Elsa to the ground as gently as possible, he ripped off his cloak and beat out the flames that clung to it. Good job, Mandling, Gotrick said. Felix looked over and saw the Slayer pinching out the wisps of fire that had scorched the top of his crest. Hugo sat beside him, coughing. What happened in there? Felix said helping Elsa sit up as she came around. He patted her back as she coughed. Was it the ghouls? he said, looking around. Shadowy shapes lurked on the rooftops, and the bodies of those they'd killed lay in the street. Never known the corpse-eaters to set fires, Godric said. He shifted a grip on his axe as his nostrils flared. They're watching us, he growled. It was the wizard, Olaf, Hugo said hoarsely. Ghouls came in through the upper story and attacked Holtz and the witch hunter in their room. The fight got loud and Olaf went to help. By then there were ghouls swarming through the common room, attacking everyone. The wizard's fire got out of control. They cut his throat, Felix said, rubbing his own. It must have made it difficult to concentrate. My, my sons, Hugo said, looking at Godric. The slayer hesitated and then put a hand on the publican's shoulder. Hugo's face crumpled and he hunched over, sobbing. Elsa went to him, tears streaming freely down her face. She looked up at Felix. They, they tried to help the witch hunter upstairs, but they never came back down, she said. I went to find them. But the priest, he stopped me. Oh, Felix, he was bleeding, and then the goose came and he fought him, so there was so much blood. She trailed off, staring at nothing as she unconsciously comforted her father. All dead, Felix said, echoing what Olaf had said. Godric? It's as the Templar said, Mandling, Godric said, starting back towards the Garden of Moor. And I know where they're coming from. Godric, we can't just leave them, Felix said. He looked down at Elsa and her father. Elsa looked up, her features twisting into a mask of hatred. Leave, she said. Go kill them. Kill all of them. Felix flinched, but set his face and turned to follow Godric, who hadn't stopped. Why would they attack Holtz and the others? Felix said, as they moved swiftly through the ever-thickening mist. Out of all the public houses in Wurtbad, why did they pick Hugo's? Maybe they weren't a fan of his ale, Godric said nastily. He was nothing but a dim, ape-like figure in the mist, but Felix thought he could see the glint in the Slayer's eye nonetheless. Godric was angry, and that did not bode well for any ghoul. Godric, something is going on, Felix said, exasperated. If I can see it, surely you can as well. You're a poet, Mandling. It's your job to see stories where there are none, Godric said. Yuldvich said it himself. Something is driving them out of their warrants. They didn't do this, he said, gesturing to the city. Shapes ran across the mouth of an alley, and he heard a piercing shriek rise up before being abruptly silenced. More screams echoed from all over, and the smell of smoke was omnipresent. Despite that, they arrived back at the cemetery without incident. Godric didn't slow down as the gate rose up before them out of the mist. One broad shoulder struck the gate, slamming it open. Felix came after, calling out Yulvich. He hoped that the Templar hadn't already gone into the Warren. If he were right and there was a vampire on the loose, then a Templar of Moor would come in handy. Save your breath, Manling, Gotra growled, hurrying along. Felix ignored him. The ground felt soft and mushy beneath his feet, and for a moment he wondered how far the ghoul warrens extended beneath the cemetery. He is either already down there, or he is dead. Either way, he is no help to us, the slayer continued. They went inside the chapel. The smell of blood was strong, stronger than it had been before. The hole was still there, where Godric had put it. 
The dwarf looked down into the hole, face carved like stone. Manfred von Karstein is dead and gone, Manling, he said after a moment. But you're right. Someone has sent the ghouls out. But why? Felix said. And if not the vampire, then who? Does it matter, Manling? Gotrek said, running his thumb along the blade of the axe. He eyed the bead of blood on his thumb for a moment, and then rubbed it out. They are, and that's enough for me. Are you coming? Without waiting for a reply, the dwarf leapt easily into the pit and started down the ancient stone steps. Felix hesitated, then climbed awkwardly down the chain and followed suit. Within moments, darkness enveloped them. Felix was forced to trust Godric's sense of direction. He knew that dwarfs could see in the dark to some degree. Even as they moved downwards, he was reminded of their trip to the city below the Eight Peaks, and another shudder racked him. The troll thing that they had faced there was worse than any ghoul, he knew that. But it was difficult to be objective in the dark. Especially when he was certain that he could hear the damn thing scraping and crawling on the other side of the loose brick walls of the ancient stairwell. There are towns almost as deep as any dwarf hold in this part of your empire, Godric said, voice echoing off the walls. Every time they're destroyed, you just build over the ruins, like ants. Felix couldn't tell whether the thought pleased Godric or disgusted him. I've heard there had been three cities here since Sigmar's time, and Lowtown burns to the riverbed every summer when the wildfires on the plains get out of control, Felix said, more for something to say than any other reason. He kept his voice low, but it echoed nonetheless. They reached the bottom of the stairs, and Godric paused, as if stealing himself. Godric, Felix said. Did I tell you that my father helped hold down the Leech King at Helfen, Manling? Staring into the darkness of the tunnel. Held him in place while the Sturlanders put him down. His axe flashed out suddenly, striking the wall of the tunnel and causing a shower of sparks to burst into being. I have longed to test my axe against one of his kind, Manling, to meet one of the Carrion Kings in combat, Godric said. And then, more loudly, Come out, you corpse lovers! Come to Godric! He roared and cursed for several minutes spitting oaths out into the darkness. There were vague, distant shufflings in the darkness, but that was all the reply Godric's cries received. Felix's eyes became accustomed to the dark, and he blinked as he saw that contrary to his earlier assumption, there was in fact some light to be had. It was a faint, surreal glow, just enough to see by, emanating from the oddly shaped patches of mold that grew on the walls and the ceiling. Grave mold. Godric said helpfully. They say it grows on untended graves. They continued on, following on the sloping corridor. Felix thought that it might have been a street at one time, for the walls were less solid stone than stone punctuated by hard-packed river clay and soil. Vague shapes that might have been bricked-up doorways lined the tunnel, and at points in the ceiling Felix caught sight of strange rectangles that he knew were coffin bottoms. Godric's mood grew fouler as they moved further down. The sound of scuttling grew omnipresent, as did the distant hum of the river stir, which caused the riverside wall of the tunnel to vibrate and drip incessantly. Where are they? he snarled. He struck out at the walls, scoring the stone and causing the unseen scuttlers to move quicker and further. Personally, Felix was glad for the lack of enemies. His muscles were aching, and he was ready to call it a night, ghouls or no ghouls. Maybe they've all gone up. Maybe Yuldvich was wrong, and this was just a random attack by these monsters, he said somewhat hopefully. Ghouls don't attack cities, Manling, Godric asserted. Not without a lot of encouragement. He touched the wall and rubbed a bit of powder dripping from the place his axe had cut between his thumb and forefinger. 
limestone and thin manling the river is right on the other side how can you be so sure felix began when the sound of scuttling suddenly stopped he looked at godrick whose good eye widened slightly beneath felix's feet the stone gave a subtle shift oh no he said and with a shrill crack the stone gave way and they hurtled down into the lightless abyss below.